Today we're jumping into Nehemiah chapter 3 and I called my sermon on this section Motivated by Hope. Now sometimes when we come to chapters like this in the Bible, we just want to skim read them because it just seems like a list of names. Uh, how much value can we gain from this? But we do need to remember what Paul said in Romans chapter 15 verse 4 where he tells us that everything that was written in the past was written to teach us that we might have hope. And this is one of those chapters. This chapter actually does grow our hope. It teaches us about the way that God works in the world and it's worth us digging into. So I really do encourage you to take some time to read this passage a few times and try just note some of the interesting key ideas that are repeated. There's some key repetition in this section. Look at the types of people who are building, look at what they're building, and just try and notice some of what the author is trying to show us here. And as always, I'm going to dig in and I'll show you some of what I've seen. Uh, but before we dig in, if you haven't already done so, I encourage you to take some time to pray and ask God to help you to understand his word, to open your eyes, to see wonderful things about him. Obviously, what we've seen so far is Nehemiah has left Susa, where he was working for King Artaxerxes, and he's come home because he heard that the walls of Jerusalem were broken and its gates were burning. And so he has come home because he wants to rebuild Jerusalem's walls. And that is because Nehemiah was concerned for God's name and fame, for the glory of the Lord to be made known through all the world. And God's name and fame were linked with the city of Jerusalem. And so that's why he came home. What we see here is we see some of the people that who have, we've seen at the end of chapter 2 are uh, rallying together. And we see them here beginning to rebuild. Uh, so rebuild is one uh, repeated idea that we see in this section. Uh, but much more than rebuilding, we see the repetition of the word repair. So not everything was completely broken down. But a lot of the wall was in a state of disrepair. And so we see the people repairing. So we see throughout this chapter this work of rebuilding and repairing. It's very clearly the focus here. But it's important for us to see that everybody is working side by side. And... The focus of the work happens around uh, these different gates that are mentioned. So we've got starting with the sheep gate and we end with the sheep gate. This whole work goes anti-clockwise around the city of Jerusalem, uh, focusing on repairing or rebuilding the gates or fixing the sections between those gates. So they are rebuilding gates, repairing gates, and repairing sections of wall around these different gates in Jerusalem. One of the most wonderful things to see in this section is the kind of people building. And the work starts off with Eliashib, the high priest, and his fellow priests. So they took the lead, the spiritual leaders in Jerusalem, um, under Nehemiah's direction, took the lead in repairing the wall. So they're leading by example. Again, we see uh, the house of Elisha mentioned here. And then we see the priests again at work. And by the horse gate, uh, the priests are again working. So the, the priests are actively involved in this work of uh, repairing, rebuilding the wall. But it's much more than just the priests. Uh, we see a whole lot of different kinds of people. For example, we see goldsmiths and perfume makers. Um, towards the end here, again, we see goldsmiths and merchants. So it's not just the religious working, it's uh, those in the business sector, goldsmiths, merchants, perfume makers at work. But amazingly, we also see um, the, the rulers of the people at work, and they, they are spoken of often in this section. So we've got the priests, we've got the merchants and the goldsmiths and the perfume makers. We've got rulers of the people. There's one ruler, uh, Shalom's daughters are even helping with this work. So it's men and women helping. 
but we've also got a number of people who are from places outside of uh, the walls of Jerusalem. Uh, so we meet the the men of Tekoa a couple of times. So there's the men of Tekoa, and we meet them again here. But we've also got people from Gibeon and Mizpah. Uh, we've got people from a tiny little village or city of Zenoa, uh, which means cast off, so the outcasts, even they are there helping. Um, so we've got people from out of town, but we also have people building right next to their own houses. So not just the out of towners, but those who are building opposite their own houses. And we see this a couple of times towards the end of this passage in front of their house. And so those guys would have had a vested interest in seeing the wall right by their own house uh, being repaired and secure so that they would be safe. So priests, business people, leaders, uh, kind of nobodies from out of town. We've got men from far away and men from right in the city. We've got men and women. The daughters are helping there too. All these people gathering together, shoulder to shoulder, repairing the walls. In the first half we see this repetition, uh, they laid its beams and put its doors and bolts and bars in place. Uh, we see that repeated a couple of times in this section. So these must have been some of the gates that we're told in chapter 1 that were burned by fire and so they are rebuilding the doors and putting putting them in place. They want to secure the city. They want the city to look great again because God's name and fame in the world are linked with this city of Jerusalem. And so we see all the people shoulder to shoulder repairing. It's all focusing around these different gates. And if you want to look at a map, you can see how it works down uh, anti-clockwise around the city, starting up at the temple in the city of Jerusalem and working its way around the city. We also see that not all the work is equally distributed. Uh, there are guys like Baruch who zealously repaired another section, we're told. So he didn't only do one section, he did another section. Uh, and there are a few of them that we're told did another section. So the work's not equally distributed. There's uh, some people doing more than others, but that's okay. Everybody's in there working side by side. Um, also, we see that not all the workers are equally gifted. Obviously, we've got some goldsmiths and perfume makers. Uh, the perfume makers may not have been the best wall builders in the world, but they're stuck in. They are equally valuable in this task. And not all the work is equally pleasant because we've got uh, this guy, Malkaja, repairing the dung gate. Uh, this gate had this name for a reason. It wasn't nice work to be doing, um, but he's stuck in. He's, he's a leader. Uh, Malkaja is a ruler of the district of Beth Harakim and he's leading by example and he really does uh, show up uh, the men the one group who are highlighted who, who didn't help and they're here in the second half of verse 5 so the men of Tekoa they're working hard they did more than one section but their nobles would not put their shoulder to the work under their supervisors. So these nobles are highlighted as a group within the community who just wouldn't get involved. It's a reminder, you never get 100% um, cooperation in a job like this. And guys like this can really sap energy. Uh, why aren't you getting involved? You can almost imagine uh, Nehemiah getting frustrated with them. But the encouraging thing is that they really are the minority, the vast majority of the people are shoulder to shoulder, stuck into this work, working hard together. In the first section, as we've seen, we see they laid the, the doors and bolts and bars in place, gets repeated. Uh, in the second half, we see the repetition of the angle of the wall. The angle and the corner. So just as markers, obviously these doors and bolts and bars were markers on the one side of the wall, on the other side of the wall, uh, they use the, the angle of the wall to just mark the different sections that all of these guys are working shoulder to shoulder. Uh, the priests are there, the goldsmiths and the merchants and the, 
the perfume makers are there, the men and the women are there, the rich and the poor, the rulers and the commoners, everybody is shoulder to shoulder doing this work. They wanted to see God's name and fame made known in the world. They wanted God to be glorified through the city. But one very important detail that can easily be missed and really shouldn't be missed is at the end of verse 1, we are told about the Tower of Hananel. Now for God's people back then, when they heard the Tower of Hananel, it would have triggered some memories for them. Uh, this tower is only mentioned in two other places in the Bible. Uh, the one is in Jeremiah uh, chapter 31 verse 38. And if you know anything about Jeremiah 31, it is a key chapter in, in Jeremiah's prophecy where uh, the, the new covenant is spoken of. But Jeremiah 31 verse 38 says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when this city will be rebuilt from the Tower of Hananel to the corner gate. So this Tower of Hananel is mentioned in that prophecy saying that this city is going to be rebuilt. It's going to be rebuilt for the Lord. And so God's people would have been looking ahead to that day. And then another prophecy. So this prophet, Jeremiah was a prophet uh, before or as God's people went into uh, Babylon. But then more recently, the prophet Zechariah had been uh, prophesying to God's people. And at the end of his prophecy, in the final chapter, chapter 14, verse 10, uh, we also get another prophecy about the Tower of Hananel. In verse 9, we hear, The Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day there will be one Lord and his name, the only name. And then we hear about Jerusalem being built up again. And he says, From the Tower of Hananel to the royal wine press, and will remain in its place, it will be inhabited, never again will it be destroyed. Jerusalem will be secure. And an interesting thing that we see in both Jeremiah 31 and Zechariah 14 is this promise of a forever city, one that wouldn't be destroyed again. Now for Nehemiah leading this work, he must have realized that he was looking ahead. He was motivated by a greater hope than just the work that he was busy with. Because it would have been clear to this whole community that this wasn't the better Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem that they were ultimately looking forward to. But they built this Jerusalem because those future promises were linked to the current Jerusalem. This Jerusalem was a signboard pointing to the new Jerusalem and they were motivated by the hope of that day when this city would be a never to be destroyed city. And the reality is for us reading a chapter like this, this side of the cross, uh, we are still looking ahead to that new Jerusalem. And so when we get to the end of the Bible and read uh, Revelation 21, and 22 where we see the new Jerusalem coming out of heaven from God one of the incredible things that we hear in Revelation 21 is that the doors of that city will never be shut there'll be no need actually for doors and bolts and bars the gates will never be shut and so one of the key differences they're putting these these doors and bolts and bars in place because this city isn't secure but they were looking ahead to a city that would be secure. The city of God, the new Jerusalem. And it's a glorious picture that we're given in Jeremiah and in Revelation 21 of the gates of that city that will never be shut. And we're told in chapter 22 that those who enter the city are those who have washed their robes. And that image comes from earlier. One of the places we read about it is in Revelation chapter 7 of those who have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. So those who are going to enter that new Jerusalem are those who have been washed clean by Jesus. So they were motivated by a hope, looking ahead to the promised Messiah and the promised new Jerusalem, the forever city. Now that Messiah has come in our Lord Jesus. Uh, for those who have trusted in him, uh, we can be washed clean. 
One other gospel link you can chase up on this is uh, John 9 verse 7, where this pool of Siloam is mentioned in one of Jesus' miracles, uh, where he tells the man to go wash himself so that he would see again. And that again is pointing us, it's showing us what Jesus came to do. He came to restore lives. He came to transform people. And this building project was always about much more than just the city of Jerusalem. It was looking ahead to that king who had come and who would one day set up the new Jerusalem, the forever city, where there would be no need for doors and bolts and bars, a place that would be secure forever, a place in which those who had been truly cleaned, washed clean by Jesus, would be able to be in that city, enter through those gates. And so this chapter is clearly much more than just a list of names. It's pointing us ahead to this great hope, a hope that motivated them, and a hope that should still motivate us today. It should motivate us to be a people who are about the building work that we've been called to do, and that is the work of building the church, of sharing the gospel, pointing to how this whole big picture of which Nehemiah 3 is a part of was all pointing us to Jesus, and we want the world to know Jesus. So we should be encouraging each other as they were shoulder to shoulder, all of them about this building work. We should be shoulder to shoulder, encouraging each other to keep going as we fix our eyes on the new Jerusalem. And we should be wanting to see more and more people coming to know and love Jesus, to be saved by him and to join us shoulder to shoulder in the work that we've been called to until that day when we are with our Lord in the new Jerusalem. So as you dig in further into this chapter, I pray that it would really encourage you and stir your own heart to be one who continues with the work of building uh, the church with living stones, as Peter tells us. So may your own heart be encouraged as you dig further into this chapter. God bless.